Last night was an interesting one in Parliament because we're seeing, I think, the first signs of Boris Johnson cracking. And I think that at the very least, if not Boris Johnson's facade cracking, certainly their approach to how they're going to deal with this uh, COVID crisis cracking. Well, what happened last night with it was 126 MPs voted against in total. Yeah. Now, obviously, that included some Labour rebels and all of the Lib Dems, which is interesting. The Lib Dems became notorious during Brexit for neither for being neither liberal nor democratic. Right. But they have appeared to discover their liberal roots. And so they all voted against which bumped, and the DUP, which bumped the numbers up. But it was 98 Tories. And the thing is, that's bigger than Boris Johnson's majority, which is a little reminder mm. of what happened in 2019 when Theresa May was consistently having to rely on Labour votes in order to get bits of her legislative programme through mm. because the re Tory rebellions were so big. Now, the biggest of the Tory rebellions was on the meaningful vote, which was 118. Mm. Um, so we're getting into that territory for the Conservative government when you need, even with a huge majority, a large number of the opposition to vote with you to get your programme through. This started to happen with Tony Blair after the Iraq war, where he was finishing up needing opposition votes. It, and it is generally a red siren, red, you know, alarm bells, red lights, warning, warning, warning to you that your party unity is coming to bits. Yes. Whether that means the end of Boris or anything like that, I mean, he really is like silly putty, Boris, as you could bounce him and he just mm. sprawings back up again. But it suggests that there are difficulties internally. And to my way of thinking, what it does bird for, excuse me, I really do have have obviously have a cold and I can hear myself. <laughs> um, it's very noticeable. Sorry for the Johnny Cash voice. That's all right. um, it really does mean, I suspect, that um, it's going to be difficult to get further restrictions through because he just can't expect, although he may do it because he seems to be quite weak on this kind mm. of thing, he can't expect uh, Keir Starmer to continually buy his lunch for him. No. Uh, Keir, uh, there will, may well come a point where Labour decides to hang him out to dry and then it becomes a confidence issue mm. and becomes very awkward indeed. Well, it does. And I think that's when he begins to start to feel the pressure as to what the rest of the country wants him to do, because I think there's no question that he's now run up against some buffers inside of uh, Downing Street, because the way that uh, the, the Chris Whitties of this world are describing what's about to happen We've sort of been there before and nobody really believes it. I mean, apparently Chris Whitty actually told the cabinet yesterday that we were going to have an NHS that was going to be overwhelmed within four weeks, not able to deal with anything, not able to, uh, to admit anybody into hospital, turning people away. You know, the NHS is, as we've said before, um, a busted flush as far as I'm concerned. It needs serious overhaul, it needs serious reform, it needs serious breaking up so that bits of it can be made to be more efficient. But at the moment... You know, this constant kind of threat of the sword of Damocles hanging over us to go, oh, if you don't do this, the NHS will collapse. Well, I'm sorry, fix the NHS. It's become one of those things. We now, it is now very clear that the traditional argument for getting vaccinated, which is protect others, mm. that was always the traditional argument for vaccination. And it is, in fact, a very powerful one. It's what economists call positive externalities or positive spillover effects which is by you getting your vaccine you reduce the incidence of whatever the disease is and the famous example always given is smallpox right. in the population that has changed the arithmetic has changed it is not to protect others because the vaccines don't stop you getting it they stop you getting sick so the issue now it has become very clear that it, this is to protect the nhs mm. and this is an argument that professor stephen davies at the iea has made and he has said very similar things to you that we're going to have to have a very long hard think about how we run the nhs and one of the things that has stood out to me is we've commented previously and you've got me because of my knowledge of the country to comment on australia the australian government even victoria and the state governments even victoria have been far less authoritarian in response to omicron mm. than is the case over here right. because australia has a better healthcare system so we finished up with a situation where the united kingdom has turned into a healthcare system with a country attached yes. to it and that's not healthy it's not good it's really not and it's unfortunate that uh, we have sort of un un enough people to continue to keep it going. 
you know, because we've got so many of these organisations called NHS Providers, NHS Confederation, uh, you know, the NHS this, NHS England, uh, the UK, you know, security and health business. I mean, it just goes on and on. These lists go on and on. And all the same people say all the same things every single year, that we're in a terrible state, uh, that we're operating at maximum capacity, that we can barely uh, do one more operation without all falling down dead tired. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's blatant lies apart from anything else. It's what upsets me the most. And the difficulty, of course, is it's become almost impossible for governments of whatever stripe to change any of the internal structures of the NHS or to change the way it's configured. I'm not talking about privatisation here. That is that is a furphy, to use an Australian expression. It's people telling tall stories around the well. Yeah. Uh, that's not the issue. No one is is running any sort of campaign against universalism. The Australian system is universal. The Singapore system is universal. Uh, other country, the, the Dutch, the French, other countries that have excellent healthcare systems, they're all universal. They're just structured differently. They're either run on insurance or on part privatization, mm. or they're split up into sectors, or they're done through health accounts like in Singapore. Other countries do these things, and they also provide universal health care, often to a higher standard. Mm. And we've reached the point, and I'm going to quote Professor Davies again, we're throwing money at it is just not going to fix the problem because there are structural issues. Now, I don't necessarily know what they are. Many people don't know what they are. I am going to make one little observation about the mandatory vaccines for NHS staff. And Fraser Nelson has averted to this in the mm. past as well. It has become quite clear, and this has emerged also in Australia and in the United States, that a significant amount of the vaccine hesitancy is coming from ethnic minorities. Mm. And as we know from the days of the Windrush generation, there is a disproportionately large number of ethnic minorities working in the NHS. I mean, mm. the Windrush was about recruiting doctors and nurses. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, right. still, well, also, I was quite, hearing a statistic yeah. this morning that something like a third of the population of London is not vaccinated. And that could well be because a large portion of the London population um, is an ethnic population. Yes, exactly. So that's not been thought through either. Now, as a general rule, I don't buy structural racism arguments. I, I don't think that they apply in any developed liberal democracy. I don't even think they really apply in the United States. I mm. think it's mostly nonsense. But they certainly don't apply in countries like Britain or Australia that are much better governed, mm. Australia especially. So, but the thing is, it is perfectly possible to enact, you know, it, just because it doesn't exist at the moment in Britain doesn't mean it can't exist. Mm. It is possible to have legislation enacted that has a racial effect. And in this case, penalising ethnic minority NHS staff who are vaccine hesitant. And my understanding is a lot of them are vaccine hesitant because they've had it. Yes. It's not because they're into weird conspiracy theories. It's because they've had COVID already, right. which makes sense. They work in the NHS. Yeah, so this is the kind of thing where uh, it's, it's the quotation from my father when I was a little girl. Always remember to try to think your thoughts through to the end. <laughs> and <laughs> Very wise a, words. No, uh, I wish, yeah, if only every politician would do that. Yeah, think your thoughts through to the end. And I genuinely think that people have not considered, apart from the odd isolated individual, occasionally an NHS worker or Fraser Nelson who wrote an article in the Tory graph about it, um, are not thinking their thoughts through to the end with a lot of these things. And, and I find that quite alarming. I mean, at least we had a debate on this. There has been an extraordinary amount absence of, of parliamentary scrutiny going back last year, which was how we finished up with corona, coronavirus guidelines that were incredibly difficult to pass because there'd been lack of parliamentary scrutiny. At least there was a debate on this and pe people were given the opportunity, even if they didn't take it up, to think their thoughts through to the end. Mm.